Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Your Active event on the Farm to Fork strategy, where we're going to be asking, what are the policy instruments needed to reach the targets? My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist in Brussels, and I'm coming at you live from the Your Active studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Now, the Farm to Fork strategy, which outlines several targets to green the EU's agri-food sector, has sparked debate ever since its unveiling in May 2020. There have been several studies undertaken on its impact, and some of those studies have concluded that the Farm to Fork's goals are in reach, but risk a significant reduction in EU food production and farmers' income. However, environmental organizations have been quick to highlight the shortcomings of those studies and say they don't consider the full range of benefits that more sustainable production would bring to the sector. So the big question is whether these concerns about farm-to-fork inhibiting farming livelihood or disrupting the food chain are valid, or if any such disruptions would be majorly outweighed by the societal and environmental benefits of the strategy. Now, a main divide between these two sides is that Industry tends to want an overall impact assessment of the farm-to-fork strategy as a cohesive whole, whereas many environmental organizations believe that evaluating each measure in the strategy on its own is the best way to go. So, how should we evaluate the farm-to-fork strategy, and what will be the metrics of success? Let me introduce to you our, now our panelists that we've gathered to discuss this topic. With me this morning to discuss this issue, these issues are Claire Bury, Deputy Director General for the European Commission's Health Department, Austrian Green MEP Thomas Weitz, a substitute member of the Agriculture Committee in the European Parliament, Italian center-right MEP Herbert Dorfman, also a member of the Agriculture Committee in the European Parliament, Diana Lenzi, President of the European Council of Young Farmers, and David Baldock, Senior Fellow for Agriculture and the, the Agriculture and Land Management Program at the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Before we start the debate, just a couple of housekeeping notes for you all. Uh, so you'll be able to join the debate yourselves by typing in your questions via Slido there on the screen where you're watching this. You can type in those questions at any time, and I will pose them to the panelists at the end of the debate. Uh, if you already know what you want to ask the panelists, go ahead and start typing in your questions now. It's actually really good for me to know uh, what you guys are thinking about uh, early on, what you want to know, uh, so we can make sure we get your questions answered. I'm also curious about where you guys are watching from. So we're going to launch a poll to start out with. Very simple one. I'd just like to know, where are you watching from? So I'm going to launch that poll now. And you can vote on Slido. The uh, poll should be coming up there. Hopefully now it has come up. Great. So I'll just give you guys a couple seconds to answer that. Just would like to know where are you watching from? I can already see we have quite a geographic spread here. No surprise, most common answer is Brussels. But I see a lot of countries here, actually. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and close that poll in just a moment. Lots of countries here. Okay, I will, oh, they're still coming in. I'm just going to hold off. Still got answers coming in. Okay, I'm going to close it now. Uh, so we have uh, many answers there. Uh, let me just go to the results here. So we've got people uh, from Belgium, obviously, Italy, Netherlands, Ankara, Turkey, Slovakia. Uh, so mostly Europeans here, not a surprise, but we have uh, a wide swathe here. Ireland, France, this is good to know. So we have quite an international audience of you guys out there. Uh, so that's good for me to keep in mind. So we'll try to not keep this so Brussels focused and, and make sure that we're really encompassing the concerns of people across Europe. 
Okay, let's start the debate. Claire, I'd like to start with you uh, coming from the commission's perspective here. So can you tell me, do you think that the farm to fork strategy, does it inevitably carry with it some risk of reducing farmers' income or reducing EU food production? Or do you think that's not really a legitimate concern? So thanks very much, Dave. Good morning. It's great to be here with everyone to debate these very important issues. So before I come to the question of impact on production, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and just, I think, remind us all why we're doing farm to fork. I think um, there is by now a very clear, urgent need to improve the long-term resilience of uh, food systems uh, and the transition towards a more sustainable food system uh, I, I think is a necessity. We don't really have any choice about that because the cost of inaction is too high. We know that in terms of the impact on uh, air and water, soil degradation, uh, biodiversity, climate change. And also we know that important parts of food production is wasted. So we really uh, need to work on, on all those fronts. Uh, and just to take one figure, if we look at from 1997 to 2011, if we think uh, we see that between 5.5 and 10.5 trillion uh, euros per year has been lost through land uh, degradation. So the, 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 the need for action um, and the cost of inaction, I would say, is, is very high. And I think we need to weigh that into the equation when we look at what we're doing. The second thing is, and I'm sure Dave will have a comment to the details of all the studies that are out there, because there are quite a few of them uh, out there now. But one thing that we already put in the front of the strategy was that we need a systems approach. We need some an approach which is integrated and a collective package of policy measures. So we should look, of course, at the impact on supply to the extent that we can measure that, and also how we can assist a just transition in relation to the impact on supply. But we also need to look at demand and act on demand. And the last thing I want to say is, on this particular point is I think that, of course, we do have to measure potential impacts with the best tools that we have available at the moment. I think we'll see that there are some uh, imperfections and some um, difficulties with, uh, with the studies that we have out there, but we have to look at what we've got and we have to try and use those so that we can put in place the best tools uh, and consider what is needed uh, for, the, for the just transition. So I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Claire. Uh, if you could just actually move a bit closer to your computer, your, your audio is a little soft. I think if you just come closer, then um, we'll be able to hear you a bit better. But we still heard you fine, so that's OK. Um, Thomas, uh, let's go to you next. So Thomas, obviously, there is a balance that needs to be struck here uh, between sustainability and efficiency, right? We, of course, want an agriculture system that's efficient as possible, but also we have these larger sustainability concerns. So how do you think the policy instruments in the farm to fork strategy can strike that right balance? Well, good morning, Dave, and good morning all together. I mean, if we talk about efficiency, we have to see whether we talk about short-term efficiency or long-term efficiency. So if we're only looking at the one-year yield per one hectare, let's say, crops uh, in, a, let's say, an, under circumstances uh, which are good, whereas, where there's a good water supply across the year, where there's a normal climatic development across the year, uh, if we only look at that, I think this is too short that we're looking. Uh, I think it's about long-term efficiency. And let me give you an example. Uh, we're talking about replacing artificial fertilizers, not only to stop uh, the, the highly soluble fertilizers to actually uh, spill into the, the sea, spill into the soil water, but it's also about uh, replacing artificial fertilizers by green fertilizers. And this is very efficient in terms of sequestering CO2. For artificial fertilizers, you have emissions of fossil fuels, so of the gas you need to produce it. You have emissions of nitrous oxide, as an example, which is highly harmful to the climate. Uh, and if you replace it with green fertilizer, you can actually sequest CO2 out of the air uh, with photosynthesis by plant growth. And by this, raise the amount of fertility of humus in the soil very effectively. And through that, you're also investing into the capacity of the soil to store water. And as we see uh, that year by year, we see more and more droughts uh, hitting European agriculture. Well, it's very efficient to have a, a 
uh, a soil uh, um, uh, on a field that has a high capacity to store water because there you can still harvest crops even in a year that has a drought while, while the neighbor's field that has not invested into the capacity of the soil to store water is not having a yield at all or a very small one. And then if we come to the bigger effects on society, we're having extreme weather regularly and the capacity of the soil to store water is key when it comes to prevent floods. And if you look at the devastations we've seen in the floods this year and how uh, impactful, how, how, how also economically uh, that impacted the regions with huge damages, if you all sum that up and then ask yourself uh, the overall question of overall societal efficiency, uh, then uh, investing into, into uh, change of our food system, change of, of food production is the exact right thing to do. It's the most efficient thing to do. And to argue with the income of farmers, uh, well, I mean, the problem in income of farmers are the very, very low production prices farmers get. It's the very small share of the overall business uh, and overall income of the food business that ends up at the farmer's uh, uh, um, income at, at the very end. That's the key problem. So if we manage to allow farmers to get a bit of a bigger share of the whole cake, yeah, uh, then uh, also the problem of uh, uh, securing farmers' incomes, I think, is solved in the bargaining and study where also there's some criticism about, but it's clearly showing that even in a scenario that has been calculated by bargaining and parts of the agriculture would profit, would have a higher income and other parts would have a lower income. And I mean, we have cap, we have measurements uh, to also influence the market and to also support certain commodities uh, to have a proper price. So I think we have instruments to counter that. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Uh, Herbert, I'll put the same question to you. You're coming from uh, the same geographical region as uh, Thomas, but from a different political perspective. So what do you think is the right balance uh, in improving the sustainability of EU agriculture, but also ensuring the livelihood and productivity of farmers? Uh, good morning, Dave, and good morning to all our audience. Well, we actually had quite an interesting hearing earlier this week in the Agriculture Committee on the different studies uh, on the farm to fork strategy. And I think it becomes more and more clear that uh, the farm to fork strategy looks at sustainability, but has a big problem that it does not look at the overage overall picture. So I think we need to combine in Europe, in the European Union, and not only in the European Union, sustainability with food security. And to achieve this, we need to have at the same time intensive production or a certain level of production in order to feed our citizens with European food. And we need to do this in a sustainable way. Um, because it doesn't make it does not make any sense if we delocalize our production to other parts of the world and we delocalize co2 emissions from europe to another to other parts of the world this is not in the planet's interest and i think if i look at the at the different studies um which are around the, the bargaining study, the GRC study, the American study, but also others we uh, saw this week in the, in the Agriculture Committee. Um, we have a bit the problem that we need to look at the overall picture. As Thomas said before, um, we need to, uh, if I look at the bargaining and the, uh, data, for example, it does not take into account that the farm to fork strategy or acting on sustainability could boost the uh, technology. So if, for example, we need less pesticides because we have, will have plants which you, needs less pesticides, this does, is not a problem for production. Um, if we have uh, technology to use less fertilizer or less uh, unorganic fertilizer, this does not mean that we will have less production. So we need to have an overall picture. And we need also to think what is the cost of not acting? Because um, if we do not act at all and we think that we can go on like now, the, also this has costs and this costs we already see. 
But on the other way around, um, nutrition, and I think this is important if I see some studies we saw also this week, nutrition is not only a biomass model. Um, maybe feeding feeding an animal, a cow, is a biomass question. I can see how, how much proteins this cow needs, how much uh, um, carbohydrates this cow needs, but feeding people is something different because nutrition is a combination between calories, so biomass, pleasure, and tradition. And we, I think we will go on the Europeans will go on to eat meat, maybe a bit less, to drink milk, to drink coffee, to drink tea. All this in a biomass model does not make any sense because coffee does not give any additional value to our, uh, to our uh, nutrition. But it's part of, the, of, our, of our way of life and our, our pleasure. So to reducing all this to a biomass model and say we, we produce, can produce enough uh, calories uh, is simply too easy. And I think we need to find a balance. And if we do studies, we need to take into account everything. For example, I'll make you an example. If we achieve, and I think we should really work on this, if we achieve to have less food waste, Today we have food waste, food waste around 20-25%. If we halve this, like the farm to fork strategy proposes, we have we need 10% less uh, um, um, nutrition products or uh, food stuff, and we can go down in intensity. So we need to see the the whole the whole picture. But overall, I think it, as we are speaking today about uh, political measures, I think we need to boost technology. We need, need to create, and this is extremely po uh, important, we need to create a positive environment. We need to stop to continuously criticizing agriculture, but we need to create a positive wording if we want young, uh, well-educated people into, in the sector. Because otherwise, these people will not go into the sector if they do not feel that agriculture is something fancy, something interesting to do. And we need to work on the consumer in education, in telling them what means um, healthy nutrition. And healthy nutrition is not only healthy food, but it's a combination of different type of foods. So it's much more than simply saying this is a healthy, healthy food. We need to come to a balanced and healthy nutrition. Thank you. Thanks, Herbert. Uh, let's go to Diana next. So, Diana, you're representing young farmers. And, of course, there's lots of concern about young farmers leaving uh, the farming sector, like Herbert was just talking about. So how do you think that young farmers in particular will be affected by the Farm to Fork strategy? Well, uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning, Dave. Um, I really think now it's uh, going to depend on how things turn out at legislative and regulatory level, uh, what instruments we will actually be provided with uh, to achieve the targets that are in the farm to fork strategy. But especially uh, what I think is important is that we don't forget, as uh, Madame Marie was saying, that the farm to fork has basically two aims. It's not only pushing us uh, towards a more sustainable production, which is what the farmers are going to be doing on their side, but also to a more uh, sustainable consumption pattern. And we need these two elements to go hand in hand. And I think that only if we manage to achieve this through a societal uh, let's say, uh, effort, actually, we will be able to achieve the targets of the farm to fork. Because the young farmers are really trying to build the new EU agriculture. They are trying to provide safe and healthy and nutritious and sufficient food for their communities and for the markets of the EU. So we are definitely on board on wanting to find those specific um, pragmatic solutions that we can implement at farm level at national level in order to achieve a greater sustainability of the farming sector because we believe that that is the true way to move forward the farming sector. Um, a lot of things were really uh, that were already uh, noticed by my um, by the other speakers are, are true. We are uh, constantly uh, both in a very negative narrative and at the same time, we are also the ones who are uh, feeling the most on our skins, on our everyday 
uh, activity the effects of climate change. Farmers are really the first ones uh, to feel the effects of climate change. So young farmers are the ones who are trying to build a future, trying to see what the pragmatic solutions they can actually implement in order to uh, achieve sustainability. So when it comes to the targets of the farm to fork strategy, I believe that really it will have to, we'll have to see what instruments can we give farmers in order to understand what they can do, where they can find the roadblocks that are uh, keeping them from being more sustainable, from being more efficient on their farms. And that is kind of how we will then, I think, achieve the greater picture of a more sustainable production and consumption for the EU. Thanks a lot, Diana. David, let's go to you next. You guys have been studying this a lot. So let me ask you a, a general question. What will be the main impact of farm to fork uh, according to you guys going forward? Well, thanks very much, Dave. And good morning, everybody. I'm not a clairvoyant, unfortunately. But what we do expect, uh, first of all, is that there will be big changes on demand side as well as on the uh, production side and these are important because a lot of the studies very much focus on what's happening inside the agricultural community and they don't necessarily um, reveal what's going on in demand and the sort of thing I mean is far more uh, of a shift to sustainable products motivation inside the retailers and the processors to promote actively more sustainable products new opportunities for um, uh, fruit, vegetables, um, healthier products with less salt and sugar. So I think there's a very positive side of the equation which tends to get underestimated and we expect more new sources of income for farmers for environmental services including um, provision of biodiversity services, carbon sequestration services and we can expect there will be aid schemes from governments coming in to help farmers through a transition and we see for example in the Dutch uh, coalition discussion very big packages being discussed, uh, huge sums of money potentially helping to come in along the transition and we can see that Europe will be uh, amongst the leaders in trying to achieve sustainability and making this crucial link with the uh, health of the of uh, the food system so we can expect to um, draw economic benefits from that in the longer term so it's not that individual studies are completely irrelevant or useless it's just extremely difficult for them to capture the full range of change so i don't expect uh, such doom and gloom as sometimes people have assumed on the basis of some some searchlights in the dark if you like rather than a kind of holistic package and it's difficult to produce the holistic package and look at it together because we've got to get all the different parts in place we haven't really got them all there yet. So we do need impact assessments around individual initiatives. For example, exactly how we're gonna bring nitrogen surfaces down, pesticide surfaces down. And then we can start to see how those work together and get those interactions, which are completely crucial. I mean, very often we see gloomy pictures at the beginning when we um, uh, went through a big change in the car industry and emissions, for example, and it hasn't turned out that way. The car industry has survived pretty well. So let's not um, let's not prematurely um, see a disaster around the corner until we've actually uh, put all those pieces together and seen um, the, the, the upside as well as the necessity of doing this. Yeah, it's a, a complicated endeavor for sure. Let me ask the audience another question. So based on what we've just heard from our panelists, do you guys watching think that the farm to fork strategy is paying enough attention to sustainability issues? I'm going to open that poll now. Go ahead and vote. Uh, in your opinion, do you think the strategy as it exists right now is paying the right amount of attention to sustainable, sustainability issues, not enough or too much? I'll give you guys a little bit of time to answer that. Um, and maybe while you're answering, let me go to Claire, uh, because I want to put this question that uh, David was just talking about to you, Claire, because of course this is your 
this is your baby, the, the farm to fork strategy, and now you're watching these studies being undertaken, evaluating uh, how it's going to affect different parts of society. Um, in the studies that have been undertaken so far on the farm to fork strategy's impacts, do you think that enough consideration has been given to the full range of benefits uh, that more sustainable production would bring to the farming sector and agriculture more broadly? Or do you think that those benefits haven't been fully taken into account in some of the studies so far? Okay, thanks, Dave. I just want to clarify that I didn't conceive the farm to fork strategy, but I've been taking it on as an adopted baby since it was born. But yeah, baby. do that very willingly. <laughs> do that very willingly, of course. Um, so, yes, I think as I was saying in the intro, uh, the studies that are out there give us some elements, but I think I very much concur with what David's saying. Um, and I think to a certain extent Herbert's saying the same thing in terms of needing to look at the, the whole picture, although he might interpret it slightly differently in terms of where we need to put the emphasis. Uh, but I think uh, the main uh, issue from our side is that many of the studies don't really capture how the downstream agents like the agro-food industry, retailers, and probably more importantly consumers uh, will change their behavior. So I think uh, a comprehensive assessment can't be based on analysis that stop at the farm gates. Huh? Uh, we have to go beyond that. Um, and we also need to take account, uh, and that's notoriously difficult to predict, uh, what innovation will bring, what digitization will bring. I mean, we've tried to factor that in, and I think it's very important as well that we balance that too, in terms of uh, how that can compensate for, for the challenges. But if, if I take um, a specific, Obviously, a lot has, of emphasis has been placed on the targets as well, and the targets are an important part of the strategy because they drive the ambition. Um, but if we look at something like pesticides, we're working at the moment on the sustainable use of pesticides directive, in particular the, the targets and how we integrate uh, that into targets that the EU and the member states can, can work towards. And of course, those targets um, will trigger behavior and trigger differences, but it's equally important to look at what's happening at alternatives to the chemical pesticides which are, are coming onto the market. So I think uh, what everyone's saying about taking a holistic view is important. There's one issue that Herman raised that I just wanted to come back on because he seemed to be sort of pitching uh, sustainability against food security. But when the strategy was conceived and very much the way that we look at it in terms of it should be implemented from the Commission's perspective, there may be some moments where we have to look at how those two things fit together. Um, and we may have to do that in a slightly different way than we have done in the past. But I don't think that the two concepts are at odds. And I think we will be able to reconcile the two. We have uh, the contingency plan on food security, which has already been adopted, which is part of the strategy. So I think uh, that food security is very much hardwired uh, into the strategy too. But yes, I agree um, with David that we need to capture the full range of change and it shouldn't just focus on supply, it should also uh, look at demand. I want to thank Diana for her very positive engagement in, in this whole process. I think when she talks about it, clearly uh, the young farmers and, and all the farmers uh, as well. But I think the young farmers in particular feel this um, responsibility, let's say, to take on sustainability and, and push it forward. So um, I've said it before and I say it again, uh, the farmers are part of the solution and we have to do it together with them. Thank you. Well, I have good news for you, Claire. The plurality of respondents, just under a complete majority, say that the strategy is focusing the right amounts on sustainability. 46% uh, said that sustainability issues, uh, it's the right amount of attention that the strategy is paying. 30% said it's not enough, that the farm to fork strategy is not paying enough attention to sustainability issues. And 25% said it's paying too much attention to sustainable sustainability issues. Uh, so an interesting split there that it's roughly equal, uh, the people in our audience who think that uh, that needs more attention to sustainability issues. And then I think a, a portion of our audience, an equal portion of our audience, or slightly, slightly less, that think that perhaps it's going too much in that direction at the expense of uh, the livelihood of farmers or food production. Herbert, let me just get you to respond to what Claire was just saying. I mean, 
Uh, are you saying that these two things are, are opposed or an either or, uh, or do you agree with Claire that the two things can work together, sustainability and productivity? Well, no, it's clear that they need to be combined. And it's, this is fundamentally what I was saying before. I uh, We spoke here in the parliament and in the agriculture world some years ago quite a lot about sustainable intensification. And I have the impression this idea is a bit out of the debate now. This combination of sustainability and intensive food production. And this, I think, it is important to rethink this concept. We should not create this idea, at least I personally think, that we can achieve um, sustainability only going down in intensity or in food production. Because I continue to think that we have in Europe a responsibility to feed our, our, our citizens but we have also a responsibility to feed the world. Uh, we are the biggest food exporter of the world uh, and um, providing food for the whole planet is an important challenge, which is not solved for now. And the population is not decreasing, is is increasing. So we should not think that we can achieve the goals simply producing less. Um, I think we need to combine the two things. And, uh, and, and this, I think, is the big challenge. And I personally think to achieve this challenge, we need to invest in technology, in research, in knowledge, uh, in education uh, of the farmers, um, and uh, also, also in advisory systems um, for the farmers. We need to, to combine this, these two concepts and, and not, not thinking. I sometimes have the impression uh, somebody thinks that we will, um, we will achieve our sustainability goals going back to good old times where fundamentally each farm produced a bit for, it, for, it, for itself. This is, not, this is not the way to go forward. Um, Thomas, let me get you to react to that. Uh, and also, what do you think about this issue of uh, whether sustainable production is, is being factored in enough in the studies that are being undertaken? Do you think some of these studies are focusing too much on these productivity concerns that Herbert is talking about? Well, many studies have a bit of a narrow view uh, on, let's say, only uh, the developments within the agricultural sector and missing actually the bigger picture of the societal impact and also the societal costs, or also missing out on the potentials of new incomes. We're having huge discussions across the European Union with the industry when it comes to, to CO2 certificates, to costs of CO2 emissions. And it's a very effective tool to use agriculture to actually sequest CO2 out of the atmosphere which creates an, an added economic value. And th just this as an example, where I think it has been, well, either underestimated or not really covered by many studies, just as one example, or all the health impacts that we're having uh, on our society, or also directly on farmers, uh, when it comes to the use of pesticides, as an example, uh, it's not just uh, the, the consumers that are affected by the residues, but it's also very much the farmers that have massive health impacts of the use of pesticides. And just to reflect a bit on, on Herbert Dorfman's statement also. You know, uh, it, it very much the argument comes, it's about European food security. I'm a big fan of European food security, but he actually contradicted the argument in the very next sentence. Europe is the biggest agricultural exporter of the world. And now just uh, uh, look at the size of our uh, continent or part of the Euro-Asian continent, uh, continent. And you see, I mean, we're having a very effective agriculture and we will be even with a bit less yield uh, uh, on a higher sustainable value still be 
very easily able to feed our European population and to export food. And especially when it comes to consumers' behaviors changes, which we see already uh, less consumption of beef, as an example, or less consumption of dairy products. We see that also through that change of consumer patterns, uh, we're actually freeing, I would say, fields to produce crops for humans rather than for animals. Um, and, and so in this relation, uh, I, I think we need to also very much focus on the long-term food security. And we cannot deny that climate change is there, it's happening. Uh, and, and as Diana said, it's us farmers that feel the impact of global warming first. It's it's in farming, it's in forestry. You know, we see forests actually dying uh, due to heat stress and so on. Uh, we, we, see, we see impacts of heavy rain fall of droughts uh, on our landscape. So to secure our long-term productivity and the security of production, we have to invest into environmental measures when it comes to climate uh, uh, change, global warming, but also to uh, aspects like biodiversity and the loss of, of uh, uh, um, species uh, and, and, and varieties. Uh, but also, I mean, massively the question of soil degradation. The soil is the, is the gold of our food production, that's what we need to take care for. We need to prevent any loss of soil, uh, in not either to saltification, to erosion or however. So it's about protecting our soils. That has to be a, a long-term focus to secure long-term productivity and, and food security. So it's the discussion for me is very much focused around the question, do we only look at the very short term, this year yield on my field, or do we really find solutions to ensure long long-term food security and long-term food production. And that's very much what the discussion is going uh, about uh, for me. And just one sentence to technical solutions. There are very many interesting examples of technical innovations out there which are reducing the, imp uh, the input of pesticides or, or fertilizer, which are increasing actually the yields even in organic agriculture. And I'm happy to welcome these techniques. We just need to have a close look what is really useful for farmers, what is actually, uh, in, let's say, uh, uh, in, a, in a scale of investment that it allows our medium-sized farms to also uh, implement it and not just the very big landowners and also we need to make sure that we're not handing over control of the food systems to, I don't know, four or five multinational companies. And let me very directly here uh, point out on um, technical solution of gene editing that is very much discussed. You know, I, I think that uh, genomic technologies are a big advantage also for breeding because you can use uh, gene tech sequestration to actually speed up normal breeding processes of, of variety and, and, and seeds, you can speed it up very much because you can sequest your results and you don't need to go into try and error anymore. So you can actually develop new species very fast you don't need to experiment with actually manipulating the genome as such with all the dangers that it brings. So you see the technology as such is interesting. The question how we use it, uh, we need to discuss about it, what is really useful for farmers or what is just useful for the ones that want to actually get patents and, and make a lot of money around that. So there we need to be very cautious. Um, Diane, uh, Thomas was just mentioning how you said earlier that the farmers will be the, on the front line of climate change. They'll feel the effects first. So do you think that the studies on the farm to fork strategy are taking that into account enough, that the benefits of, uh, of mitigating those climate impacts for farmers, the benefits that that will bring? They are giving us some information, but of course, not all the information that we need. And I think that I don't th really think that any study would ever be able to take completely into consideration the huge diversity that we have at European level when it comes to our farming systems, which is why uh, I think what really kind of scared off the farming community to start with was that the farm to fork was maybe even unfortunately presented in a very like rigid way. There were targets, there were numbers, it looked like there was an uh, an algebra recipe that was supposed to, in a way, kind of uh, introduce or, or bring farmers to be sustainable as if they weren't. Um, I think if we'd kind of probably 
told the story a little differently. So if we'd looked at, for example, the target on fertilizers saying instead, we want to improve soil health, uh, both on its like the structure of soil, but also on the nutrients of soil, that could have been a different way of also involving the farming community into a, a, a positive, proactive kind of message. When it comes to pesticides, which I like to actually call plant protection products, because that is what they are, uh, they are, instruments that farmers need in order to keep their crops, their plants healthy. Uh, if we had talked about that also in the terms of how can we improve plant and crop health? And so this has a lot to do with farmer education, with the really making, putting the farmers at the center of this process in helping them in this transition. Um, and to do that, we most definitely need to close no doors. Uh, I've heard today um, talk about uh, carbon sequestration, great instrument, great opportunity for farmers, but right now it's still a, a let's say, when it comes to the measurability or the viability or the profitability of carbon sequestration, everything is just still talk. Uh, and instead farmers, even if we don't want to look at the year to year yield, still actually have to manage year to year budgets for their families. Uh, we've talked on the other side about new genomic techniques. Great, open doors, because that also can be a solution. But right now we don't see it as a viable instrument because we're missing a legislative framework in which that can actually be a viable instrument for the farmers. So there's so much work that we need to put together in order to actually achieve these goals, in order to bring the farming community and give them actually instruments that they can apply at farm level to change the systems, to find those efficiencies. So we need a great palette of solutions, practical ones, nicely uh, regulated. And then I go back to the fact that this is not just a productive problem. We have a, it's a general societal problem. If we don't bring the world of consumers, if we don't explain at the same time to the consumers what is going on in the production system, why, for example, there will be probably a greater cost, why we can't afford to be, as farmers, always the scrunched element in the value chain when it comes to profit, well, if we don't bring them on board and if we don't have them also fight the fight for us, agreeing to pay a greater price or agreeing that a greater slice of the cake goes to the farmers, then, then I don't see this as a system that can actually work. But I do see it as a system that if we all work together can actually uh, be achieved. David, I want to put to you a related question that's come from the audience and it's about how we measure uh, the impact of farm to fork. Um, so the question comes from James Picara from IACA, uh, and he wants to talk about the impact that we already know from different studies. So he asks, what about the EU position on global markets? Uh, is the commission against a global impact assessment? Um, David, I'll put that to you, and then Claire, I'll have you answer that as well. So David, how do we measure the impact, and is it important to do it as a strategy, as a whole, looking globally, or should we be looking to analyze it specifically and the impacts in specific areas within Europe, uh, within sector? Well, as I was just sketching earlier on, it is quite difficult to capture the whole global picture because it isn't just the product of the individual proposals in the farm to fork, and there are quite a lot of them, 27, 28, if I remember rightly. It's also the other changes going on in and around that in the market, in health, in technology, and in the interactions between um, uh, all the different components in the system. So I'm luckily not in the commission and having to decide, you know, what, where the impact assessment is framed and where it isn't. But I do think we need to have quite a lot more detail of exactly what we expect in those specific areas, for example, on pesticides, an important and 
you know, often controversial point. And we need to then build up a holistic picture. So I've got quite a lot of sympathy with the commission not wanting to come out with a premature holistic um, impact assessment when it really hasn't got all the moving parts in place. Uh, that's not to say we don't need to build up that picture and to be discussing it in quite a lot of depth. And uh, for example, I do anticipate there will be um, in Europe more extensive agriculture, more organics, but also areas where we have high tech systems, high yield on quite small areas of land um, with, with a low carbon footprint and some land will go out of production. And we need to see how th th those will go into carbon sequestration and enhance biodiversity. So, so we need to understand how those circles and interactions work. Um, so I think if the commission came up with a sort of premature big picture um, impact assessment, that, that wouldn't be great, um, but we still need to, to, to see how it work, works together. And I think just to pick up very briefly, um, Diana's eloquent points about uh, the involvement of farmers, I think there's a little bit of a, a deficit in the narrative right now, and we do need to talk more about a just transition and engagement with farmers and everybody in the food system so that we can build this picture together. I think we do need that intensified debate period. So Claire, let me put that question to you from the audience. Is the Commission against a global assessment? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, what we've said so far, and that remains our position, is that each of the measures has to have the impact assessment. Now, of course, when we do that impact assessment, and we're in the process of doing one now for the sustainable use of pesticides, then we have to look at the overall context as well. And we take the information that we are getting on the overall context. As, as David says, we're still piecing all the bits and pieces together on that, but we will put our individual uh, analysis against the overall context and, and farm to fork in general. I think why is it important to do the individual impact assessments? Because we have to have the granularity of information around the individual measure to be able to make sure that we construct it in, in the right way um, and see to what extent uh, transition measures may be needed. As I mentioned before, um, on the sustainable use, we're not just looking at the targets, we're looking at the whole uh, issue in the round. And that, of course, is that the farmers will need alternatives. We're working, for example, on the microorganisms to accelerate the approval for microorganisms. Um, and this whole debate around alternatives will continue with the member states as, as we move forward. But if, if I can just say a word about context on the pesticides, so there is what we know about chemical pesticides, the most dangerous ones being removed from the market, which has been in, on, on the way for quite some time now. But of course, then we have to look at what does precision agriculture bring us in terms of uh, benefits to farmers, in terms of use of, uh, I'll use Diana, Diana's word, the plant protection products. Um, there's also, of course, the transition to organic agriculture. Um, and then there are uh, the new genomic techniques, which I think uh, Thomas mentioned and Diana went to as well in a very positive way. Um, so there, there is the question of putting in place a regulatory framework which responds to innovation. I mean, this, as I said earlier on, the challenge is really how can we make sure that we bring, uh, we nurture innovation through funding, but then also the very important thing is take up of innovation and, and how we can do that. And I think we're going to be looking at that with our colleagues across the commission uh, going forward. But the NGTs, we want to put in place a more appropriate, uh, a more uh, proportionate uh, framework of course, Diana, as you know, as well as I do, and Thomas knows very well too, these things take a bit of time because people want to understand what the new genomic techniques mean. We have to consult on them and so on. But to come back to the first question, we are not against um, looking at the overall impact. And so we put in place a monitoring framework and that monitoring framework will accompany the farm to fork measures all the way along, we will monitor in the middle, and of course, we will monitor at the end in terms of, of what the impact uh, of the measures has been. Thank you. 
Thanks, Claire. We've had many questions come in on the same topic, which is how the strategy will account for imports. Uh, so I'm going to read them all out as a group. And Thomas, I'll have you answer this first, because one of the questioners specified you specifically. So uh, Alexandra asks, uh, there's a lot of mentioning about securing production to feed the European population. But does the farm to fork strategy address the imports of high demand foods like bananas, almond, rice, et cetera, that are not cultivated in Europe? How can we account for those in terms of sustainability? Joao Pilon from EPP. A uh, puts his question to Thomas, what about the external impacts of the farm to fork? Studies point out to the fact that a diminished production in Europe would increase imports from Africa, and this would increase food insecurity for them. Paul-Henri Lava from AVEC uh, says, all studies demonstrate that even though we will produce in the EU more sustainably, this will be offset by imported emissions from third countries. Can we be serious about environmental protection without strong requirements on imported food? Marcos Freija uh, asks also how the policies of farm to fork eco credits specifically would impact the trade demands to outside of EU suppliers. Uh, and finally, Lynn Fortin from Canada kind of turns the question on its head and says, you know, we've heard a lot about the need to protect the EU market from imports, which is concerning from Lynn's perspective. What is the best way to ensure trade can continue while achieving the intended results of the strategy? An outcome-based approach has proven effective in the past on health-related objectives. Why not continue? So Thomas, a bunch of questions there on the same subject. How do we account for imports in this strategy? Thank you for all these questions, uh, very interesting ones. Um, we are having a debate, uh, and, and there I, I think we, we all share a standpoint acro across the political spectrum that uh, this is a key question. We cannot put higher requirements on our production, on our farmers, uh, and, and increase, uh, uh, I would say, the uh, well, well, the demands uh, towards the agricultural sector when it comes to environment and sustainability, and at the same time not actually trans transferring that requirements to the imports. Uh, and who heard, I don't know who heard uh, President Macron lately in, in the plenary. Uh, even even uh, Macron is, is very much advocating for reciprocity, so for mirroring our standards also on imported products. And this is a principle we have asked uh, for, for a very long time and it's actually implemented or on the way to be implemented first time ever with the so-called CBAM, so with the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically the same principle. We're saying to our industry, look, you have to reduce your CO2 emissions and you have to pay for the ones you're emitting. So we're actually increasing the price of production in Europe. And the industry was very clear. They said, okay, we can do that. We can go into innovation. We can do the investments, but you have to make sure that we're not put out of market market by cheaper and lower standards imports and import products uh, uh, that we're, that are coming on the market as an example steel yeah and we need the very same principle also for food it's really not understandable why uh, we're we're uh, per, we're uh, um, uh, but ruling out the use of the most harmful pesticides in the European Union already, which are forbidden already in the European Union, but you can still import products that have been produced with these kinds of, of uh, pesticides and with, which have these residues. So we need the same kind of standards. The question on what does that to the global market? Well, the European Union may be at the spearhead of the transition and of the change, but these discussions are going on across the globe. And in fact, it's a global issue issue that we're having. Global warming is a global issue. And if we're not managing to tackle it on a global level, well, we're, we're going to see very heavy effects on our economies, on our citizens, on our nature. And so uh, it's a global approach that we're having. And we're trying to convince other regions of the world, and some of them are heavily working on it already, to actually follow us in the path of tra transition towards a sustainable and climate-friendly production, because this is an urgent need on the global scale. And again, we, we have to look at the change of consumers' patterns. In the moment, we're importing millions and millions of hectares
masses of produce of animal feed and animal fodder from abroad, from South America, from other parts of the world, which were then actually stuffing into the animals here in the European Union, which were then exporting again into half of the world. But that amount of meat consumption, it's key that we look at reductions uh, that have to be achieved. And through reducing the amounts of, of, of uh, dairy products and meat that are consumed within the European Union, we're substantially reducing the amount of imports that we need. Uh, third, uh, we can also uh, um, change our means of productions uh, within the European Union when it comes to protein production. Uh, there is ways to uh, change our models on how we use uh, uh, green land, uh, so, so uh, meadows or grasslands uh, um, with for, for well, uh, short, short grass silage production, which has a very high protein uh, uh, amount in it, uh, or, or changing also in, including more uh, leguminosis, so, so uh, beans, uh, lenses, and so on, uh, into our production schemes, into our crop rotation. Uh, the positive effect is that they are sequestering uh, uh, also um, fertilizer nitrogen into the soil uh, and, and uh, are, re are, are replacing actually fertilizers and are replacing imports in the protein sector, which will again reduce our amounts of imports that we're having from abroad. And if you talked about Africa, and indeed in, in countries or in regions like Africa, yes, we have to look in a, into an increase of production also. Uh, there's a lot of room for professionality, for education to the farmers there. There needs to be investments. Uh, so, so that is very clear uh, that, that there's still a potential of increased production in many regions of the world. And also so this needs to be in the center of our attention. Herbert, what do you think about this issue? Uh, how do we account for those imports in a way that still maintains trade and doesn't fall into protectionism? Well, actually, um, it's clear that the European Union, and especially if it comes to, to food imported export, is not an island. We are heavily trading and, uh, on, on, with food products. We are the biggest importer and the biggest exporter in the world. And I think there is a double problem. One problem is if we do not achieve a certain level of reciprocity, as Thomas said before, we risk to delocalize CO2 emissions. And this is a bit a problem all over the Green Deal. Um, if we want to achieve this 55% reduction target in the next, in this decade and become climate neutral. This is a good proposal and is positive. If this does not mean that the CO2 emissions go out from Europe and will be somewhere else. Um, because if, we, if they are somewhere else for this planet, doesn't matter if the CO2 emissions are here in Brussels or I in fishing is the same CO2 and it's the same problem for the planet. So this we have to look um, and therefore I say we need to produce our food in Europe. And then we have to look that we import a lot of products which simply we cannot produce in Europe. If I think that one of the most important products we imported, uh, food products we import to Europe, coffee. How do we want to achieve reciprocity? There is no coffee production in Europe, or oh, a very low one. There is a very, very low production of bananas, for example, and we can and you can add a lot of products. So uh, we do not only import products which we can produce also in Europe, and then we can come to other products like Thomas mentioned before, uh, feed for animals. Well, we can reduce maybe, but I hope. I'm sure we will eat meat and drink milk cows in the future. And today, 95% of the of the soya we, we are using in Europe are, is coming from outside. And if we want to stop this, this import, we stop our uh, meat industry and we stop our dairies in Europe from one day to another. And I make it just an example. We decided, and I'm very much in favor of this, that uh, all GMOs we, we do not plant in Europe because we, our consumers don't want them. But we are not able to ask for reciprocity. 
because most of the soya coming to Rotterdam every day is CMO soya. Because we know that otherwise is it, not, it is not possible to, to, to have enough import to get enough product. So it's not, it's not that easy, but I'm very much in favor of, of also the, the approach of the French presidency to work on reciprocity and have a very, very strict look that we are not going to export uh, CO2 emissions because I think this would be uh, also uh, it seem, uh, not a, a good behavior of European policies to say, okay, we keep our own house uh, uh, in in a good uh, in a good situation, but the dirty things we we export them to other parts of the world. We this we did in the past. We should not restart to do this. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of foods in our normal diet, like bananas, which can't be produced in Europe, or certainly at least not sustainably. Uh, David, let me put this question to you. How 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 do we address these concerns? I mean, we could make production agricultural production in Europe incredibly sustainable, but if we're still importing uh, goods that are uh, agricultural products that are not sustainable, uh, is, does it defeat the purpose? Uh, well, I think that's a very valid set of questions and something we're definitely going to have to address. There's quite a few different issues in there, one of which is that we don't want to undermine our own domestic standards when we're trying to be more sustainable by uh, then importing foods with a higher environmental footprint. And that same thing goes for animal welfare, for example. If we end the cage age in Europe, we then don't want to be then importing um, uh, foods produced on farms with cages from the rest of the world. So it, it's a very clear issue. And on the other hand, we don't want to be causing environmental damage um, it, in uh, forests, for example, and, and, and contributing to issues which are not so much European issues, but they're global issues. So we've got to step up to seeing the best ways of engaging in this reducing global impact alongside addressing European impact. Um, we shouldn't always assume that European products are more sustainable. That is not always true. Uh, it is true definitely in some areas and less so in others. So we're going to have to recognize that and, and bottom them out. Um, um, and what we do see, I think, is a case for developing standards which are applicable to imports into Europe. But these will have to be negotiated. Um, I don't think they can be imposed tomorrow um, on suppliers in the rest of the world. Uh, and in our trading partners. So it's very much a question of where the Europe can take an initiative here, come up with workable suggestions, put in place the data and the credible monitoring and scientific processes that people can actually see you know, where the facts are, what is sustainable, what isn't, and we can believe in that. Uh, and then to start um, persuading our trade partners uh, where we possibly can to engage in that. So that's it's quite a big program and it, it's not going to happen overnight. So I think getting on with it is important. Claire, uh, Claire, how is the commission planning to address this issue? We know on a macro level we have the, the CBAM, but particularly when it comes to the farm to fork strategy, how do you address this issue of imports? Okay, so I think, I mean, first of all, general comment, because uh, it's come up already, but I think obviously the EU has benefited hugely from, from free trade, so we have an interest in keeping that open. But then on the other side, we're asking a lot of our farmers now, as we've already explained through the farm support strategy, so we need to take that into account. So there are two things uh, that the Commission's doing. The first is that in the farm support strategy, uh, there is um, a chapter uh, which sets out a very proactive policy of engagement that we have with third countries. Um, and that has been underway uh, since a couple of months after the adoption of the farm support strategy. Uh, we've been talking bilaterally, we've been talking multilaterally uh, to a number of countries. We've also been talking uh, to countries and managed to get clauses on sustainable food systems in agreements. So uh, already we have um, discussions ongoing with Chile, Indonesia, Australia and New Zealand, just to, to, to name a few. So there's very active engagement going on. It's also um, hardwired now, becoming hardwired into our development policy in terms of uh, engagement and improving sustainable food systems. So this is very 
proactive, positive engagement. Uh, the second thing is, of course, the French presidency has put the so-called mirror clauses, uh, the reciprocity, whatever you want to call them, uh, at the top of, of their agenda. And there are active discussions going on that. The commission is to produce a report the final version by June of this year on this question of imports. But in the meantime, there are a couple of areas where we're already moving forward. The first of them is the maximum residue uh, limits in relation to the plant protection products, uh, because the neonicotinoids have been banned within the EU, of course, but are still used uh, in other parts of the world. But we think there are very clear arguments which say that um, the use of the neonicotinoids is really of global environmental concern because of the negative impact uh, that it has uh, on pollinators. And therefore, we're in the process of considering whether we would restrict imports uh, with residues of those pesticides in them. And just to close, we already have the um, veterinary medicines regulation, uh, Article 118 of that, which requires us to look at the question of imports which come from third countries, which use um, antimicrobials as growth promoters or where um, they use medicines which will have been restricted for human use, which we're in the process of doing at the moment. So then I think that's a very clear example of a mirror clause which we have, uh, which we're working on already. Thank you. Okay, new topic now. Diana, I want to put to you an interesting question that's come in from Mauro. Uh, Mauro asks, do the speakers think the measures being discussed today will affect industrial farms and small medium-sized farms in the same way? So do you think that larger farms are going to be more equipped to deal with the farm-to-fork requirements than smaller farms? Uh well, probably. Uh, as usual, they will have a, uh, a greater financial capacity to adapt. Uh, one of the elements that was put forward before as one of the instruments that we could uh, tap into to achieve greater sustainability is precision farming. But precision farming instruments are very expensive instruments that not all farmers can afford. And that is one of the things that I fear the most, that, um, that we need all of these solutions to be actually solutions that can be viable for the farmers. Because um, I know this has been said and said and said many times, but we can't only look at our, let's say, ecological sustainability if we don't also achieve a social and economic sustainability for the farmers. So the fact that an industrial farm and a capitalized farm can have a greater capacity to also uh, implement, uh, let's say, a technological advancement is something that most probably uh, would be harder for a small scale farmer, which is why we also need solutions for small scale farmers. We also need, as I said, that uh, education, those uh, financial instruments uh, that can come from the cap, outside of the cap, we really need to believe that this is a uh, something that that wants to restructure EU farming as uh, truly one of our added values. I really believe that our agricultural system and our productions are one of the greatest added values we have in Europe, and that needs to be defended exactly for that. Not only for its um, for its um, nurturing process but also for its history for also its uh for its excellences that can't be diminished so and that have to do a lot with uh with small scale farmers with uh localized farmers with uh gi's uh quality and uh things that we just can't scale into into quantity but have to do a lot with quality and that quality then also needs to become an ecological quality uh, that we will need financial instruments in order to achieve. So we might be less equipped, but we are more motivated coming from a small scale farmer as myself. That's a good way to put it. Uh, okay, so Thomas, we've had a question come in for you from Porik Fleming. Uh, and it's about basically whether the strategy is focused too much on the farm and not enough on the fork. So he asks, is there a danger that our focus is too much on production? Should the focus of sustainability be instead on consumption? E.g., should we shift all carbon taxes and penalties to consumption? Would this lead to a level playing field for production and help solve trade issues? Well, thank you for that question. I am, Even if you have the payment, 
performance of the CO2 emissions on the production side, this is uh, directly causing a slight increase of the, of the consumer prices. So at the end of the day, consumers paid their share uh, with the food prices uh, that they at the end pay at the supermarkets. But we, we talked about it earlier today, the share of what farmers get from the cake, that from the actual price that consumers pay in the supermarket is very low. And we have to find ways to increase that share. And that is with or without the farm to fork strategy, because we see that we have a massive loss of farms every single year across the union. And we need to stop that. We need to keep people on the land. Uh, so, so, um, I think that that is it's a it's a shared uh, responsibility, and I mean to look closely to the consumption uh, patterns. That's right. I mean it's also about promotion. It's about talking about health. It's also about public procurement. You know, more regional, more vegetables, uh, more more. Uh, uh, um, uh, plant-based diets yeah, that doesn't mean that we want citizens not to eat meat anymore or milk but just to reduce the amounts and we can steer a lot also with public procurement and let me say just one word on precision farming i'm a small farmer myself but there are different solutions at, uh, uh, out there and many of them are really fit for purpose also for small and medium farms not everything is super expensive you know to have a cell phone next to your tracker which is actually telling your mechanical weeding device in the back, uh, close to one centimeter to the row where to weed, and the phone is able to actually detect up to five different cultures on a field. This is a technology that is affordable also for a medium-sized farmer. And you know, if you plant onions or carrots next to each other, they are protecting each other from most of the pests and you don't need the pesticides anymore. Or to have a drone which is dropping a, a clay ball with useful insects every 10 meters over your field. You know, a drone is not a massive investment and even farmers can share it and we're used to share these kind of investments, you know, with our neighbors. You don't need that drone every single day and you, with the useful insects, you can again replace insecticides. So there's a lot of solutions out there. Let's not only look at the solutions that the big companies are proposing where the data is then their property and where you are actually, uh, well, <laughs> you as a farmer end up to be a machine driver for the industry that tells you via uh, artificial intelligence what your machine has got to do. So there's different solutions out there and we need to look at these, I would say, the ones that are also fit for purpose for small and medium farms. David, what do you think about this idea of shifting the burden to consumers to create a level playing field for producers? Well, I don't think you can shift all the burden onto consumers. They certainly need to be fully engaged. They need to be informed. Uh, they need to be motivated. Um, but we in Europe, we do intervene heavily on the supply side. You know, we have a lot of policies which help to shape what we produce, uh, what we consume domestically, what we export. And we do need to get those policies lined up in the right direction. For example, what kind of pesticides farms are allowed to use, um, what kind of incentives they're getting. So I don't think it makes any sense to ignore um, the supply side, ignore what farmers are doing, nor should we um, fail to help farmers move along the, the the path of transition. They need help in doing that. They need uh, to be given a, as clear as possible picture where we're trying to go, help in getting the right technologies. And uh, Thomas just outlined some really good examples of that. Um, and also Europeans care about the way the countryside um, looks and whether it's sustainable, but they also care about the cultural uh, and the social aspects of it. Most Europeans don't want to see huge industrial farms everywhere. They actually want a balanced rural society where there are opportunities for younger farmers, for small farmers. And that won't come naturally if we just let the market rip. We'll end up with US style farms, um, with, with, um, um, agriculture migrating to the coast, Texan style product. So um, while Europeans feel that way, we, we should intervene. We should try to, to get some alignment between what we want in the countryside uh, socially as, as well as environmentally. So um, 
I, I think that's totally legitimate and it's a tricky balancing act, uh, but there needs to be something in there uh, to make sure that there's uh, social renewal, there's, there's, there's a, a genuine pathway for young farmers coming in and really making a difference and for getting people to have opportunities in the future. So I wouldn't be in favor of a sort of US style market led approach. No, I think I think we we have some idea what we want in Europe and we have to have the courage of our convictions to try to bring it about. Well, we're just about out of time, but Claire, I did want to put to you one question. It's on a very specific uh, aspect of the policy. The, the question is from Annika Gat Seretny, and it was the most upvoted question, so I want to make sure I get it in. But if you could answer this as briefly as possible. Uh, so, Claire, could you tell us more about the Sustainable Food Systems Legislative Framework? It does seem to hold promise and many answers to the questions about policy instruments needed for farm to fork. So, Claire, can you just briefly touch upon that? Uh, you're muted, Claire. Sorry, there was noise in the background before. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, very relevant. And I think it takes us right back to this question from the beginning about working all the way along the, the food chain. So the idea with the framework is that it will be horizontal and it should accelerate the transition to sustainability uh, all the way along um, by putting the, the sustainability objectives and principles uh, in an into what we call an integrated system uh, approach. I think what we'd be looking at is having uh, minimum standards on sustainability uh, across uh, the food chain. Uh, we need, I think, to work on the middle of the food chain as well. Obviously, with them, we have been doing the uh, code of conduct, uh, but I think we need to look at where it may be more relevant to make sure that there are specific uh, uh, minimum standards uh, that will apply. Obviously, we will look at sustainability in um, according to its definition, where we have three parts of it. So there's the, of course, there's the environmental sustainability, but there's also the social and the economic uh, sustainability. We will want to factor in both what we call uh, push uh, measures uh, and pull measures. So push in terms of making sure that uh, the industry takes account of sustainability, but also I think Thomas mentioned before as well, the need to look at areas like uh, procurement to make sure that we have the relevant uh, pool measures in place as well. We will be uh, soon starting in the course of this year a public consultation on that. So I hope it's going to be something that we will, an instrument that we will have a dialogue, a very intense and hopefully fruitful dialogue uh, over the coming year. The proposal is planned for the second half of 2023. We also, we, we talked about the new genomic techniques that will need to fit into this overall framework. Um, and we're also coming forward with a legislation on seeds where we'll look at the question of sustainability that will also need to be uh, compatible with the, the overall framework. Um, I stop there, but this, uh, thank you very much for the question because this is really an issue on which we want to engage debate now in the coming year. Thank you. Thanks, Claire, and thank you to all the panelists for some great insights there, and also thank you in the audience for some fantastic questions. There were so many questions that came in, and obviously we didn't uh, have time to get to all of them, but the good news is, as I think all of you out there know, this is one of the most live issues in uh, EU policymaking at the moment, farm to fork, so there will be no shortage of discussions about the farm to fork strategy in the coming year, I'm sure, so we have plenty of time to talk about all of these issues. So thank you so much for spending your morning with us, and I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Take care.